Okay, thank you very much for coming and dedicating this afternoon to the UK Innovation Hubs for Gene Therapy. Uh, I'm Nicoletta Charlidi. I am um, the Deputy Director of UK Advanced Therapy. Sorry, this is a very new title for me because I'm deputising today for Francesca Grubik, who couldn't, the Director of UK Advanced Therapy, who couldn't be here with us today. Uh, You'll know a little bit about UK Advanced Therapies. We came together in 2021, but we have history a little bit before that. Uh, we started in 2019, just in London, um, log as London Advanced Therapies, or LAT. Uh, LAT received money from Research England to bring together the three uh, London universities, Imperial College, where I belong, uh, UCL and King's, and little by little integrated uh, also with Queen Mary. And um, we did activities to um, uh, create collaborative spirit within London and with industry and SMEs around London. And in 2021, uh, when we were well organized with London, we expanded and connected uh, also with um, the Northern Ireland, uh, the South, um, the, the, the Southwest, uh, the, uh, the North and Scotland, um, integrating all advanced therapies of UK together. Um, so today we're going to hear from the Innovation Hubs, uh, an uh, initiative with the help of our collaborators in MSC and um, um, LifeArc, uh, where we're trying to put together uh, some uh, skills activities and other training in trying to, in an effort to align uh, the UK advanced therapies uh, community coming together and be more prepared for the future in advanced therapeutics. Uh, so, uh, before we start and we go to our first speaker, I would like to um, let you know some of our housekeeping notes. So we're running this session as a Zoom meeting, as you can all see, and you, you, there's going to be horse breakout rooms later in the agenda. Uh, I would like to ask all the participants to keep their microphones and cameras off during the presentations and the roundtable discussion, if possible. If you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. And um, if your question uh, is already mentioned there, you can upvote other people's question. We can then kind of we can help you can help us prioritize asking the questions with highest votes. Um, you can also uh, have raise your hand and ask a question. Um, and in that case, I will ask you to unmute your microphone, and you'll be invited to ask the to, to to ask your question to the speaker you want. Um, and I think. Uh, that, that's all for now. Uh, so can I just then move to the first speaker uh, who will present from the Innovation Hub, Kwasim, Professor Kwasim Rafik, uh, um, who's going to use um, his presentation. Um, are you ready to upload your presentation, Kwasim? Yeah. Thank I you am much. indeed. Is, is that sharing? Sorry? Is that sharing on the screen, my presentation? Yes, I can see your presentation. So, yeah, Professor Rafik is an Associate Professor in Cell and Gene Therapy, uh, Bioprocess bio Engineering at the University College London, and he's the Skills Lead for the London Innovation Hub. Um, so, uh, also, Professor Rafik sits at the cutting edge intersection between biology, chemistry and engineering, with a focus on biomanufacture, and of the very latest advanced therapeutics, including, including regenerative uh, cellular and gene-based uh, uh, therapies. Okay, so I'll just hand over to you. Thank you very much, Nicoletta. Many thanks for that introduction and uh, many thanks to all of our delegates and participants uh, for joining uh, this webinar today. Uh, we've got an action packed session and, and really I think it provides us with the opportunity to really discuss and engage on a topic which I think all of us have a passion for and which we all recognize is a major challenge for the advanced therapy sector, including cell and gene therapies moving forward and delighted to be able to share some of the work that we've done within the innovation uh, for gene in innovation hubs for gene therapies around the skills development. Uh, so just to give a quick overview as to what we're covering today. Uh, so as part of the webinar, um, I'll be delivering a presentation no more than about 15 minutes, just to give an overview of 
the work that we're doing within the innovation hubs for gene therapy around skills and training uh, and discussing the strategy, how we've developed that strategy and how we've communicated and worked with the with the community to develop that strategy um, and what our plans are moving forward. We then wanna move into a roundtable expert discussion and we'd love to have your input. We wanna have you, know, you putting your questions forward to the panel where we're gonna have a discussion around uh, the challenge of skills and so on across the sector. Before we then move into breakout rooms uh, at about 4.50, where we then wanna kind of have more individual feedback, both based on the strategy, but also your comments, thoughts, and suggestions on what things should be what we should be focused on, what should we what should we be targeting? Because although we've undertaken a survey and a strategy, as I'll discuss, what we'd very much like to do is continue this engagement and feedback process. It doesn't stop at the end of the publication of our report. As you'll see, it's an ongoing live discussion, and that's something we'd very much like to engage the community on. Uh, and then we look to try and close the event at about quarter past five. So uh, let me kick off by giving a brief overview of the Innovation Hubs for Gene Therapies. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the Innovation Hubs for Gene Therapies, and, and they're the webinar uh, where we can share the link that has, you know, in great depth and great length, uh, explain the purpose, the scope, the objectives, um, and the composition of these gene therapy hubs. Um, so we'll make sure that a copy of that link is sent out after the meeting. But we also, I thought it'd be important to give a brief overview for those of you that aren't perhaps as familiar. So the Innovation Hubs for Gene Therapies were originally funded about two years ago now um, by the MRC, the Medical Research Council, uh, by LIFARC and the BBSRC. And the idea was to create a UK network of academic manufacturing innovation centres within the gene therapy sector, primarily looking at AAV, and lentiviral GMP production. So manufacturing centers to support in particular preclinical and early stage academic clinical projects. And I think the rationale very much being, and I recognize this being an academic myself, is that often when you're trying to secure funding to generate your next innovative gene therapies, most of that funding you secure would often go overseas to different manufacturing companies, particularly over in the US or elsewhere to get GMP vector. And it was fantastic to see this initiative emerge from the MRC and from LIFARC and the BBSRC to actually recognize there was a need to maintain that capability within the UK to support the academic cell and gene therapy sector, which is the heartbeat of much of the clinical innovation that we see and innovation within the gene therapy space. So that's kind of a brief overview. The focus is very much on lentivirus, AAV, and lots of translational support with a focus exclusively on manufacture and process development. But a core part of that, and obviously the focus of this webinar today is on the training and skills requirements. And we'll discuss that in a bit more detail. The final thing to mention is the composition of the hub. So there's three hubs, what we call the London hub, which is led by King's College London and involves uh, the Royal Free Hospital and UCL. Uh, there's the Bristol hub, which is led by NHS Blood and Transplant uh, uh, Services over in Filton, and then the University of Sheffield or the Sheffield hub. And they all have slightly different focuses, but, uh, but much of it is very complementary and synergistic. And that's very much the case with the skills and training strategy. So touching on that uh, skills and training strategy, you can access the link and we've just published a report. And really the, the purpose of this webinar was to disseminate some of the key findings from that report and really to start to disseminate the work that we plan to do and how we want to engage with the community moving forward and how we want to build the sector. So before any, you know, before undertaking any kind of long-term strategic plan, we realized it was, <clears throat> it was critical to be able to consult with the community. We recognize that it's one thing us having our own ideas about what skills are needed, but ultimately we need to be able to engage those who are working in on the factory floor, so to speak, those who are working in industry, those who are working in the clinic, and those who are working within the academic sectors as well. And more broadly than that, you know, we wanted to involve the work and expertise of consultants as well as regulators. So one of the things we undertook as part of the initial um, strategy for our uh, training and skills agenda was to canvas experts within the cell and gene therapy field, particularly in the gene therapy side, and looking at how 
we can focus and address some of the manufacturing challenges. And there were three purposes to this survey that we undertook. The first was to understand what is required with regards to skills and, and needs, provide some initial feedback on some of our early plans. And we've actually adapted some of our early plans based on the feedback that we've received. And to really start this idea of thinking, well, we know what the training needs are now, but what are the training needs in five years or 10 years? That's the long-term vision that we want to have, not just for the hubs, but for the sector as a whole. So as part of this, um, the hubs work together to identify key individuals across the sector. And we held, held um, a number of interviews between November 2022 through to March 2023. In total, uh, I think we sent out a number of, uh, of invites and, and we were delighted that we actually had uh, a great response from both academic and industry experts. And again, a good mix of both uh, academics from different disciplines, covering different perspectives, the fundamental bioscience, as well as some of the clinical aspects and the more translational aspects. And likewise, in industry, we had a range of uh, industrial colleagues, partners who were able to provide some input into the actual survey itself. So we feel that although, you know, we certainly could have canvassed wider and we'd love to continue that conversation, hence part of the, the, the webinar later today is getting more input and feedback. So for us, the conversation doesn't end, but I think we've got a very good understanding of where things currently are and where we'd like to be. And fundamentally, what we wanted to do with this uh, skill survey was try and highlight what should the remit of the hubs be in terms of their training and skills agenda, and how do we ensure that it's complementary to many of the other fantastic initiatives that are currently ongoing. So, for example, the work that the catapults are doing around, for example, the apprenticeship scheme or the advanced therapy skills training network, and and also company specific training as well. How does it how does that align with things like the BIA, for example, and their training and skills agenda to ensure that we're not reinventing the wheel and we're not stepping on any toes but actually we're providing something of value to the sector so what did the survey tell us and and the survey is now publicly available uh the report is available at that link that i showed earlier i'll just go back to it in case you haven't got it so gene therapy hubs uk forward slash training you can download a copy of the report which summarizes uh the outcomes from the survey as well as the survey questions that we asked but what were some of the key findings well, it definitely highlighted need for training in specific areas. And that's really what we wanted to get to. We wanted to get some granular detail. So it highlighted things around quality and quality assurance, uh, GMP manufacture, not just manufacturing and bioprocess, but GMP in particular, um, things like clinical trial design, uh, obviously regulation. And obviously, as we start to embed quality into our development and on our manufacture, you know, critically thinking about quality by design, design of experiments, and ultimately, how do we commercialize um, some of these therapies moving forward? The other key findings were not just about, you know, areas that we should focus on, but how should these courses or these programs be developed and, and delivered? What would be amenable to industry? What would be amenable to people working in the NHS and so on? And one of the things that we found was that the hubs um, can and it should have a distance learning option, and there should be distance learning material made available to individuals within the hubs. So one of our key objectives was how do we train, retain individuals who are working within the London, Bristol and Sheffield hub, but also how can we support the wider industry? And, and distance learning was seen to be a key opportunity to take advantage of that or, and, and perhaps in combination with attending short courses. So three to four day short courses where people can take a week off work, paid leave, whatever it might be, to upskill and take a, a training course. We also recognize very clearly the limitation, and this came very strongly, about practical hands-on training. There's one thing about learning the knowledge and the content and understanding, but being able to apply and, and develop practical skills, whether they be GMP skills or other skills in terms of manufacturing or, or quality assurance, whatever it might be, the, the lack of practical hands-on training was something that came through very clearly. And, and it started to raise a question to us about, do we start to think about offering placements to both our hub employees, but also those external to the hub as well? And then also we recognize that actually as the technology, the teaching and learning technologies improve, we should start to embrace these. So for example, the idea of using virtual reality headsets and so on, especially where we can perhaps uh, design, and, and there's been some fantastic work by a number of companies within this space to look at mimicking a GMP clean room 
uh, and being able to work in a virtual reality environment. So how do we integrate some of those technologies as well? And then finally, as I mentioned, what are the future skills that might be needed both over the next two to five years, but also five to 10 years? And there was lots of comments about things around artificial intelligence, digitalization, machine learning, and ultimately big data. And so this is where I think probably the amalgamation of the report comes down to this single figure. And I'd like to thank my colleagues who've been working very hard to create and work on this report and put together this key figure, which, which really captures the essence of what we want to do as part of the hub based on the feedback that we received in the survey. Ultimately, what is going to be our training strategy? Now, the first thing I want to highlight is we've deliberately outlined some of the other training courses and activities and organizations that are delivering training in this space because we don't see ourselves operating in a silo or a bubble. It's very much in line with and complementary with many of the existing activities. But also we wanted to make clear that we were hopefully adding value with actual tangible outcomes and programs and sources and so on. And so I'll start very quickly and I'll just run through some of the key activities. One of the identify one of the opportunities we realized, particularly with the London and Sheffield hubs, which are connected to universities. So UCL King's College uh, for the London hub and University of Sheffield uh, with the Sheffield hub was the opportunity to create bespoke training programs. So many of you may be familiar with the program that we run at UCL in the manufacture and commercialization of stem cell and gene therapies. And whilst I think that's been very important for the sector, that is it currently a one year full time program. As part of this hub, what we're doing is we're creating um, a distance learning two year part time program to take that same program, which has you know, been very important for the sector, but now make it more accessible and more amenable to those working in industry and importantly, those working within our hubs. And likewise, colleagues at Sheffield are also launching their own course. Likewise, we've identified the opportunity for MSc research project placements, but ultimately we realized much of it was gonna be around distance learning, online self-paced, academic placements, accredited short courses, developing a series of seminars, webinars, workshops, and events, and ultimately integrating this with the wider activity across the sector. So to briefly introduce, and I won't go into any detail because we wanna save this for the discussion, but I'll briefly introduce some of the key activities the three hubs are working on. And what we've done is we've tried to make all of the activities within the hub synergistic, but also ensure that it works with the wider community. So at the University of Sheffield, uh, which is led by Professor Janine Kirby, who is the hub skills lead for uh, the Sheffield hub, uh, an MSc program has been created um, focused on advanced cell and gene therapies with the first intake in 2021 and 2022. And delighted that the MRC and, and the funders have been able to arrange bursaries for the network to take on two home students where 50% of the home fees are covered per year. In addition to the MSc program, there's also the focus on developing uh, postgraduate certificates and CPD modules to start to align and focus on some of the smaller area, some of the smaller uh, topic areas or more specialized topic areas, which can be covered in short courses or through the use of uh, CPD modules. In particular, the areas that we identified earlier or was identified by the experts within the sector around clinical trial design and uh, regulatory approval. Likewise, um, at the Bristol Hub, which is led by the NHS Blood and Transplant Center, uh, the focus for their skills and training activity has been very much focused on developing practical sessions for new and existing staff. In addition to that, creating some online learning materials for healthcare and academic workers. Uh, and these include e-learning modules, which are part of the NHS uh, BT Learning Zone. Looking at creating uh, bespoke training programs for staff within the hubs. And some of that learning can be extended to those connected to the hubs as well in addition to hosting some of the apprentices, and, and this is where we want to try and connect with existing schemes such as ATAC, the Advanced Therapy Apprenticeship Scheme. Um, how do we host apprentices within the hubs, as well as developing online taught programs for lean GMP manufacturing? And as you'll see in the, in, in the work that we're doing in London, creating a single portal for all of this online material, regardless of whichever hub is producing this, to support and deliver that and have it in a centralized location. And then finally, uh, the work that we're doing within the London Hub. So this is the hub that's led by King's College and involves the Royal Free Hospital and UCL. I think there's a number of things that we're all doing, but the key activities are very much how do we create and develop that 
a two year part time distance learning MSc program so that it can be used as a mechanism to retain and upskill staff both in industry and within the hubs. And the focus of that MSc program is very much on the manufacture and commercialization of advanced cell and gene therapies, creating online uh, and interactive learning modules. So we've actually created much of the content already, and we're going to start to showcase this out and roll this out over the coming weeks and months. Focusing, and each module is about 40 minutes to an hour, where it goes through lectures, questions, and material focused on a range of topics, ranging from bioreactors and bioprocessing through to Lean Six Sigma and quality by design, through to GMP manufacturing and, and so on and so forth. So really trying to identify some of those key areas um, that, were, that were recognized by the experts as being areas that needed development. We've also created and launched a short uh, course, uh, a cell and gene therapy bioprocessing course, uh, which ran earlier this year in March 2022, uh, 2023. That ran online, and next year we plan to run it in person. We've had some fantastic feedback on that program, we had, and we have some amazing expert speakers from industry and beyond who present on that course, and it's really a crash course in cell and gene therapy bioprocessing. And again, the idea is to support the hub members, but also external uh, partners. And then finally, something that we feel is important for public dissemination, but also to bring abstract concepts to reality are these professional animation videos, which focus on things around gene editing, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, as well as um, the idea of CAR gene therapies and lentiviral vector transduction, just to bring some abstract concepts to reality. So finally, and, and just to wrap up, the network itself is very much focused on not just the manufacturing capability and, and addressing the gap that we have in the UK in accessible GMP viral vectors, but also how do we address the infrastructure to support that? And how do we critically address the skills gap, which you all recognize is a major issue. Each member of the, the, the hub and um, within the, the network skills and training group brings a huge amount of expertise and knowledge and, and ultimately complementary knowledge. Um, and that's really key to see as part of the training offering. And as I said, we're trying to create an online program that will, will be with content from a range of partners that will be delivered to the hub members and beyond, and ultimately create a range of training opportunities. In the first instance, we'll, the plan is for the hub users, uh, sorry, for, for the hub members themselves, but to extend that to others, particularly with the, the emergence of the MSE programs and some of the workshops as well. So with that, I'm delighted to have been able to present that. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues at the various hubs, uh, and in particular Sophie, who's been instrumental in putting all of this together and, uh, and making sure that we've been able to deliver not just on the strategy, but also supporting uh, the delivery of the skills agenda. And I think now we're going to go straight into the panel, if I'm not mistaken, but there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussions as we go into the breakout rooms a bit later. But I'll hand it back to Nicoletta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kasim. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent overview of the activities uh, that, uh, that the innovation hubs are undertaking. Uh, yes, it's time running. So can I just quickly ask all the panelists are taking a part in the roundtable discussions to put the cameras on, please? Excellent. Hello again. Can I just ask? Each and every one of you, uh, take it in turn to introduce yourself, uh, say a little bit about who you are and the activities uh, for, for the skills and training that your organisation or yourself are involved with. Shall I just maybe ask, start from Uta? Thank you, Uta. For me to start. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Uta Griesenbach. I'm a professor of molecular medicine at Imperial College and have been working in advanced therapeutics for probably 30 years or so. Um, I'm also a non executive uh, director of the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult and I chair the Innovation Hub um, Skill and Training Committee. Thank you, Uta. Uh, Angie? Hi, I'm Angie Miller. I'm um, the skills lead, the LifeWatch skills lead for the Innovation Hubs for Gene Therapy and also a senior business manager at LifeWatch. As a technology transfer professional um, involved in the skills, I've been in every involved in every aspect in ensuring that uh, not only are we working towards the skills agenda and devising that, 
but also that any technologies that come through will be able to get to the patient at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Helen? Good afternoon. I'm Helen Delahaye. Um, I'm Vice Chair of the BIA Cell and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee and also lead the Skills Working Group um, within that industry partnership. Uh, we have uh, three work streams. Angie kindly leads the one uh, focused on teachers and our younger potential employees of the future. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Diana Hernandez from Anthony Lonan, um, who um, looks after the undergraduate group. And finally, we have a postgraduate team who focus on uh, looking for skilled individuals who, who may not necessarily be scientists, but may bring other important skills to the sector, such as IP, legal, uh, HR, accounting. We're a sector that is in need of many different roles to function well. So um, I'm really passionate about supporting the skills agenda, but also making sure that as Kazim uh, mentioned earlier, that we don't step on anyone's toes, um, but also ensure that we're all working towards a, an equitable, diverse and inclusive approach to skills development. Um, and so we're, we're glad to be working closely with uh, Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult um, and with other colleagues, ABPI, et cetera. It's important that we do all work together uh, to increase the number of people coming into the sector. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Rafael. Thank you, Nicoletta. I'm Rafael Janez. Uh, professionally, I'm a professor of advanced therapy at Royal Holloway University of London, and I am the current president of the British Society for Gene and Cell Therapy. I think of particular relevance, the society uh, convenes a stakeholder panel with representatives of both academia and biotech and a large pharma with the idea of uh, discussing in, in an open forum issues of interest. And this area that we are discussing today has had a particular focus in the context of that panel. Uh, thank you, Rafael. And lastly, Steve, our last. Hi, thanks, Nicoletta. Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Stewart. I'm head of skills at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. So I look after um, our skills programs, the Advanced Therapies Apprenticeship Community, um, which has got 300 apprentices across 56 businesses um, in the sector. Um, I also look after the ATSTM program, Advanced Therapies Skills Training Network. Um, within that, we've got an online training platform with over 2000 users. Um, and we also coordinate uh, uh, three national training centres, um, which uh, are focused on short face-to-face -face skills courses uh, across the UK. So absolutely echo um, what Helen said. I think collaboration's really, really key to this. And I'm really looking forward to see how we can work together and, and support each other. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, to, to, to just get the discussion going, I realize how much going on uh you all seem un unstoppable in terms of skill and activities uh undertaking at the moment but uh just to let us know what any of you in the panel what would you uh, identify as um the area of greatest need for the uk advanced therapy sector with respect to training and skills development Utah. You do your mute. Let me try this again. Um, but I think it's a it's a very broad question and very difficult to answer because I think many areas are equally important. You have you know the manufacturing and bioprocessing. You have regulators. You have NHS staff that needs training. You know to deliver the um, licensed medicines and conduct the clinical trials. Um, and, and you need the sort of postdoc and academic pipeline, you know, to bring through talents. So, so, so in my view, they're equally important and I think need to be taken equally serious and need to be funded, you know, to get developed and, and to get off the ground. 
Thank you. Is there anyone else wants to add anything on this question from the panel? Ellen, Angie? Yeah, I I, I echo Uta's, um, Uta's sentiment. Not only is it um, basically those that have to, for example, process development, but also um, one thing that came up with some of the discussions is also those who, for example, the healthcare professionals who need to deliver the advanced therapies, that's going to be an issue as well. But what we've also seen is that there's a shortage of those pro providing training. So actually training those that are coming through, not only do we have a skill shortage, but also um, a shortage of those who can provide the training to, to train those because we have more positions than we have individuals. But this is something that we know is going to grow with, with the, the community anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll ask another question. I yes, don't know how many. Raphael's hand is up. I don't know. If sorry, can... I couldn't see. Raphael, sorry. That's right. Thank you, Nicoletta. I think that in the context of this stakeholder panel that the British Society for Gene and Cell Therapy convenes, uh, there's a very strong feeling that practical skills, particularly practical experience in the context of uh, the biotech industry, is really important uh, and in, in short supply. And this is particularly acute if we think that because of the pandemic, uh, recent graduates are, are very short of practical experience. So I think that that really should be an area of focus. And those placements that are currently being considered uh, in the context of either the hubs or uh, a number of companies that are participating in similar schemes are, are really, really important. So there is a lot of availability of, uh, you know, theoretical training and academic placements, but more hands-on placements maybe in the hubs or companies are in, in short supply because obviously uh, they are costly uh, and they also use a lot of resource from those providing uh, those opportunities. Okay, thank you, Raphael. And actually we have one question from um, uh, one of our uh, members of the audience. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. It says, I understand you need a person called a qualified person to sign out a badge of medicine. Are there enough QPs in the UK and where can people train? You can, I can see you shaking your head. Do you want to take that on? Well, what, what I can say for sure is that there's certainly not enough QPs to release um, the ever-growing number of advanced therapeutics. I'm not an expert on training, so maybe Steve has something to say about this. Yeah, sorry, I put my thumbs up as well as put my hand up. Sorry, I don't know what I've done. I'll try and take them down in a sec. <laughs> yeah, we've we we hear this a lot, and I think um, not only have we we got an issue with not having enough QPs coming through. Um, speaking to some of the guys in different organisations, we've also got an ageing workforce in that area as well. So we know that we're heading heading towards a little bit of a cliff edge. Um, the training for QPs, um, one of the costs, uh, one of the barriers is cost. Um, it, it costs in excess of thirty thousand pounds, I believe, forty thousand pounds to train a QP. So we're looking um, at the initial steps of can we do something through the apprenticeship route because you can use apprenticeships to train um, existing staff and we've done it with regulatory affairs and we've worked with with you guys on that in um, in Bristol I think to to um, launch a reg affairs one so we're in the very early stages of that but we're hearing it's a real issue and lots and lots of different companies are coming back not only from this sector but from adjacent sectors as well which shows that we, we need to do something and again back to Helen's point collaboration is key we can't solve this on our own we need to work across the sector to to really address this. I thank you Steve. Raphael do you want to add? Yes, thank you, Nicoletta. I think that's that's a very important thing, but it should also be seen in the context of other needs. I remember discussing at the Sheffield 2019 uh, annual conference of the society the needs in hospitals, and something that was put to us by, by a pharmacist is that hospitals don't have minus 80 freezers. So things as simple as that can actually prevent uh, this becoming mainstream. So absolutely 
QPs are a need, but there are very, very basic elements that we take for granted in, in our research academic uh, environment that actually are not present uh, in those places where the delivery has to happen. So I think it's important to have an overall view of the needs. I, I appreciate that this is obviously focusing on skills, but very basic needs are still lacking. Okay. Thank you, Rafael. I think uh, I have an, one more question in the chat and I have a raised hand. Um, so I, just, I don't know who came first. I'm just going to ask quickly the person who raised his hand to ask his question and see if there is any conversion with the one I have in the chat, please. Hi, sorry, it's, uh, it's Mike from the Sheffield Hub. I'm the QA manager. It was in relation to the QP. It's something I've looked at quite extensively for the last year. And there is a whole host of prerequis prerequisites that are required to even start the QP training. Um, I do think the hubs will provide a really good environment for that to, to allow personal development and to allow you to tick off some of the boxes for the a study guide that's required the the courses are expensive but i have looked into one at ucl that ucl do and it's a a postgraduate diploma or masters and it it covers all the study guide requirements for qp training and part of the course is to actually complete your your application form that's essentially the course material and I, I don't know if it's an option. I know there is partnerships with the UCL. And I just thought I'd uh, put that on the table if, if you guys weren't aware of that. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, anyone wants to add anything on what Mike just said? Okay, in that case, I'll go to the next question. Um, are school leavers the type of people that can train or do you need to be a university graduate? Who wants to take on this one, Steve? Yeah, I think it, I was just thinking about the context. It depends on the job role, I guess. Um, it's um, we've got people coming in straight from school into into different apprenticeships. Um, they can study up to up to degree level. Equally, we've got people who have got experience who are coming in and studying to degree level and master's level. Um, so so it's a real mixture. It depends on it depends on the job role, I guess. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Yeah, well, one Helen has a hand up as well. Oh, sorry, Helen. Sorry, too much is going on. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, no, so following on from Steve's comment, really, um, I think you know if we're looking, you know, upwards of ten thousand more jobs needed at least, and that's in the older survey that was done, and I'm sure it's going to be higher than that as it comes up to date. Um, we do need to look at both school leavers and um, undergraduates and postgraduates to to fill um, all the jobs that are available now that, and those that will come. Um, so I think we have to look at the different areas and also with our equity, diversity, inclusion hats on. Sometimes it's difficult for our skilled youngsters to actually go through the traditional route and so looking at the school leavers particularly and encouraging our industry to um, embrace T levels for example it's something Angie is really passionate about um, in order to expose youngsters to the possibility of working uh, within our sector and these T levels which are equivalent to three A levels but provide the 16 to 19 year olds with three over 300 hours of industry experience. That's got to be an area that's going to help us with um, entry level skills and understanding. As Raphael was saying, um, a lot of the graduates coming through have not had the lab time and they haven't had the hands on uh, fixing the problems and working in the clean room environment um, setting. And also the other thing I think we need to be thinking about strongly is transfer of skills um, from one sector to another. 
So I'm, you know, I'm passionate about project management, which we haven't mentioned yet, but I think um, there are many skilled people in different sectors who could transfer across into our sector with the skills that they have. So I think we need to be thinking along those lines as well. You know, bakers have to measure stuff out really carefully to get the same consistency every time. We might we might have to look at different ways to be more creative about how we bring people into our sector. Okay, thank you very much for adding this, Helen. And uh, because we still have time, um, I'm going to ask another, one more question related to this. And it's about qualified persons in in uh, pharmacovigilance. And uh, Sven is asking, Sven Kelly from our audience asking, as more as more advanced therapies are being approved, do uh, any of the participants have training programs uh, geared towards upskilling the qualified persons for pharmacovigilance uh, function? Hmm. which is actually the next step thinking that we had advanced therapies out for a while and then we're checking in a few years time how they're doing um anyone wants to uh, Raphael, ashley i saw you uh typing an answer do you want to quickly say to us what you're thinking yeah, I was just going to answer the question uh, by text. Uh, the short answer is no, uh, not that I know of. So I think Sven is actually <laughs> absolutely right. We we need that. Uh, and probably what we also need is a way to fund uh, that because that is not currently funded as far as I know by anyone. And if you, have, if you want to have a studies 5, 10, 15 years post-treatment, that has to be funded somewhere. And just to add on this, the, the innovation hubs are looking into uh, supplying the um, advanced therapeutics coming out in the market. I think pharmacovigilance lies um, so far traditionally with MHRA, um, and maybe that's where the uh, uh, specific field for advanced therapeutic and pharmacovigilance something is uh, considered and provided by MHRA, Utah. I think in the context of some gene transfer agents, and I'm particularly thinking about integrating lentiviral vectors here, the 15-year pharmacovigilance is actually uh, funded by the sponsor, by the company who, um, you know, who funds the clinical trial. But Raphael is absolutely right. That's not the case for many, many other gene transfer agents. In this, you know, it's a specific case for the integrating lentiviral vectors. So. There's clearly a need. Okay, so um, taking a next, is there any other questions on the chat on or the Q and A? I don't see any, so I just keep the Raphael. Sorry, do you want to try something? Yeah, I think it's important. This this issue we are touching on the the funding of the activities uh, again in the context of the stakeholder panel. Uh, we have been discussing the need to train particularly UK-based workforce because, you know, I, I recall Uta saying that at the masters that they run in Imperial, they train loads of overseas people who complete their studies and leave. Uh, so they get excellent training, but, but the UK uh, biotech does not really benefit from that. Uh, and obviously these particularly master's courses are, are costly. Uh, so we need to promote those uh, to UK candidates. And I think that a big part of that is being able to offer bursaries. And we have been discussing in the context of that stakeholder panel, whether it would be possible for industry to part fund those, but it's actually complicated uh, because industries have a, a time frame. Uh, for budgeting that doesn't really match what would be needed for this. So I think that that is a really important consideration. We are identifying a lot of needs, but we also have to allocate budget so those needs can be met. Otherwise, just we won't get there. Angie, you want to add to this? Yeah, I mean, this is this is something that has come up time and time again. Postgraduate courses, are not well supported for UK applicants. There aren't, there isn't 
like uh, there aren't that many pools of funding. So in the advanced therapy space where the chances are you, it's very specialized, you are gonna need additional training. There needs to be some mechanism of actually supporting UK applicants. The reason why there's such a huge number of um, overseas applicants, because you know the training that the courses that are there are accessible for them, but it's not affordable and accessible for UK individuals, whether you're in, in the profession and want to upskill, or you are thinking of entering the profession. So it's a real, it's a real pinch point, it's a real barrier. Um, one way is possibly to have um, more part-time courses. And this is something that has been touched on by the report that was launched, um, but it's not gonna solve it. It has to be multiple ways. And, and this is where, whether it's sponsored or it's, it's government funding, additional government funding. But the thing is, there needs to be additional funding to support um, postgraduate training for, for sure. This is also an issue, um, as Rafael mentioned before, with placements. I'm an advocate for industrial placements, so the year out in industry. A lot will complain and say that, for example, the year is not enough and you don't gain enough skills, but compared to not having anything, I, this is something that is highly valuable. For me, I, I was one who took a year out. It, I used Erasmus. That's not open to us at the moment, but the thing is, it is where I found that the practical experience that year out in industry um, to actually understand why I'm studying science and what it's really like and what it really involves I, was invaluable for sure. Thank you, Andy. It's, it's a balancing act, really. You want to do a master's and get a better paid job, or you want to go to industry in two years where at the level you will be if you had a master's as well for UK applicants. Uh, it's a big issue. So I'll go to the next question that's in the chat at the moment. If some of the challenges around training, this is a question from I, uh, Isabel Christie, and she's asking if some of the challenges around training UK candidates linked to poor uptake of STEM at the secondary school level. I can see a lot of nodding, Angie. Yeah, I mean, this is. As, as um, Helen mentioned that I lead on one of the work packages for the BIA Cell and Gene Therapy Advisory um, Committee, the work package, working package addressing skills in schools. Um, unfortunately, um, we're not great at teaching STEM um, and the reputation that isn't helped by the fact that you have professionals um, being compared to baristas in their salaries and they're striking to actually get fair um, work environments. For Gen Z, they see it as it is. Why would you why would you train and why would you train for years, study STEM, which is taught in a very dry manner, um, when you can do something else? You, you know, basically it's it's not attractive at the moment. This is something that we are trying to change. Um, we are trying to provide resources to help the teachers. I mean, it, it's not, it's it's a broken system at the moment and it, it really does need to be fixed, but this is it's long standing, like a lot of things. Um, unfortunately, it is where I think it's changing the model that's what's required in how STEM is taught. I think, um, highlighting the professions this is something that we recognize that a lot they, they don't see a pathway, a career pathway. If you study STEM, if you enjoy it, then why not do it? But the thing is, a lot of feeling that if you study, for example, neuroscience, you're going to have to be a neuroscientist, and that's it. That's the only option where there are many things. And, and I think it's representation, talking about career paths, um, I think highlighting what the value is and the fact that we use science every day in, in everything we do. I think it will make it more attractive and put it into context for those who have an interest um, and really were put off by everything else around. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Yuta, can I start from you, actually, because we're coming to an end of the closing the, the roundtable discussions. Uh, can each of you summarise in one minute or less, that's the challenge, uh, what has been um, the key message from this discussion and what is the key message from the organisation you you represent for the training and skills sector in advanced therapeutics? I, I, I think what this discussion highlighted for me is that there are needs on many, many levels that need to be tackled by the UK government, by funders, as well as industry-based 
in the UK if we want to continue being world leaders in developing and licensing um, advanced therapeutics and without any dedicated funding which provides people with opportunities to really take these challenges on as a main job rather than many of the, many of us doing it alongside our day jobs is really important. Eve, sorry, I'm going in the order I see you in my screen. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think the collaboration, which you mentioned at the start, is key for me. We've got some really, really big challenges out there, and I think the only way we can address them is working together. We've we've got some good programs at the Catapult that I think we can leverage. So the the apprentice program, the online training platform. Um, I, I, love to connect the hubs with the national training centers and see if the, there's a way that we could work together to, to, to fill more gaps. But I think even to, to Angie's point before about going into schools, it's it, we can work together to make people really excited about careers in science. And it's diluted if we all do different things across the industry. If we go in together, we can do something so powerful and, and so good and really solve these problems. But for me, I think it's really exciting to read the report and hear from you guys. It, 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 we're doing very, very similar things. And I think if we work together, we can be a really powerful force. Helen? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think we have the opportunity to make a difference. We know we know the system's broken at the moment, and we know that um, our sector and other life sciences sectors and the NHS and, and, and are in need of that longer view strategy for bringing in the number of people that we need um, within the whole life sciences community um, and the more we collaborate together the best chance we have of um, filling all those different roles and giving all those opportunities to those that want to have a career in the life sciences whatever guys that that has um, but I think um, we have to tackle it at every level. Um, we can't just be looking at postgraduates or undergraduates or children. We have to look at the whole thing because we're way behind the curve of the need of the country at the moment. Angie? Without repeating everything that's been said, um, I completely agree. It, it's Collaboration is key. I think the positive thing is that we can see where there are gaps and we, we know a lot that can be done. I do think that whoever we need to reach at the higher levels to ensure that there is that, you know, infrastructure and that larger investment that needs to take place. I think we need to ensure that there is a pipeline, not just recognizing, you know, where we can um, get um, individuals to cross over and transition into this sector. I think it's ensuring that there's a pipeline right across the board because it. This is one sector that we're talking about. There are issues in every sector. And if we're going to be superpower by 2030, I, I think it's going to have to require a lot more than what we're doing at the moment. So it's investment. I think it's being strategic. I think it's all sectors working together. And I think it's right the way from schools, right the way up to those individuals that, you know, who have a lot that can teach others, those who look as though they're going towards retirement, they are invaluable with their knowledge. And I think we need to make sure that we make use of these individuals right across the board. And lastly, but not least, Rafael. Thank you, Nicoletta. I, I think that for me, um, the practical experience is key here, uh, is to make sure that those individuals are competent and they are attractive. To, to the biotech community when the time comes. So I think that providing uh, those placements or those uh, hands-on masters, uh, ideally embraces, is very important and those need to be funded. But I do agree that in the long term, what you need is to ensure that we have young people interested in STEM. And more and more, we, are, we have come to think that even primary school uh, is important, not just secondary school. Very early decisions matter in terms of the choices that those students are going to make. In the context of the British society, we have prepared 
a number of hands-on activities and we have an, an annual event which is a public education that is essentially directed to schools so we have the experience to engage both at primary and secondary school level and we would be delighted to work with any stakeholders who want to do that and obviously as the british society for gene and cell therapy our aim is to be the umbrella organization who supports the community uh, for the advancement and translation of gene and cell therapies which is our vision so we would be delighted to support any initiatives in this area and we have the experience to do that excellent thank you very much thank you very much to the panelists what i understand collaboration is key is very very important and ultimately i think people love to do what they're good at and as long as we keep making them be good at science we're there right now uh, okay we have everyone back so thank you very much for being part of this uh, evening and learning everything about innovation training, innovation hubs for gene uh, therapy are doing. Um, just as a closing, just to say uh, this webinar, it was it's a part of a series of webinars. And of course, um, in order to, to keep collaborating is the main element of of, of this effort, but I uh, keep reporting back and learning how the hubs are doing is very important. So it will be a couple of events like this organized per year. So we'll see you again very soon. And just thank you for your input and the vibrant discussions I was able to witness in the breakout rooms. Uh, have a lovely evening, all of you. Thank you. <laughs>